My name is Tony Vassallo. For 37 years, I was a prisoner. Not the criminal type of prisoner that first comes to mind, but I sought out the same type of freedom a prisoner seeks. In 2010, I was over 300 pounds and classified as morbidly obese, unhappy and unhealthy. And then, everything changed. I found my way to freedom. I found others that were also being held hostage of their weight and found their way to permanent freedom. Come follow me, follow them. Before we do, here's how I became a prisoner of morbid obesity. I was born in Malta in 1972, a beautiful island in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. I am the only child of Tanya and Joe Vassallo. We immigrated to Canada when I was two years old, and I grew up in the East York neighborhood known as the Danforth. I was a very skinny kid until grade six. During the summer break between grade five and six, I exploded to the point that even my classmates and teachers didn't recognize me when I returned to school in September. What happened? Well, I discovered pasta, candy, and soda. I became obsessed with food. I remained obsessed with food throughout my adolescence, and I was one of the fattest kids in high school. I caught the travel bug in my 20s. I loved taking road trips and weekend trips which were typically what I refer to as food vacations. My weight continued to rise through my 20s. At 30, I moved out of my parents' home and into a downtown Toronto condo. This made it easier to binge. My medical issues emerged around the time I moved out and it included borderline diabetes, acid reflux, high cholesterol, and the occasional bout of gout. My issues with gout were frightening. There were many nights I woke up in so much pain, I just wanted to cut my foot off. And there were many days I strolled into work and I needed a cane. I mean, think about it. I was 30 years old and I needed a cane. My weight gain and medical issues continued to expand. In March of 2010, two things happened. The first, a visit to my doctor's office. He weighed me in, and for the first time, I was over 300 pounds. He looked at me, then silently ticked off, morbidly obese. The second thing happened a few weeks later. I needed a suit because the suit that I had bought a few months prior no longer fit. I found a suit that I liked, took it to the change room, and there I was trying to put my pants on. They were a size 48 and they wouldn't fit. I just stood there and I recollected how I went from a 42 to a 46, a 48, and now I need a 50, the, the big 5-0. But what really hit me was, where was it gonna go from here? Was it ever gonna stop? 54, 58, a 60. I just left everything in the clothing store. Pretty sad, pretty pissed, pretty scared. And I just went to my car and sat there. Probably for about half an hour. I watched the other fat guys come and go. But the thing that was going through my head was how how did it ever come to this? I finally gathered myself together and drove home. I immediately began to make changes. I didn't have any official plan. Uh, did the obvious things like eating less junk food, more vegetables, no more soda pop, and I started taking short walks. 
I wasn't weighing myself, but I was making progress. My doctor set me up with a dietitian. I embraced some things, others not so much. I didn't buy into the whole portion control thing. What I did do was avoid junk food. My motto was eat crap, stay fat. I didn't want to be fat, so I didn't eat crap. As the weeks passed, I continued to make progress and lose weight. I was determined not to be a fat guy anymore. I joined a support group and went to weekly meetings, and I met lots of great people. From a dietary point of view, I had my own game plan. Yeah, I listened to the advice from my dietitian and support group, but I was a bit of a rebel. I focused my efforts on the types of foods, not so much on portions. Over the next 16 months, I was able to lose 130 pounds, and I've managed to keep it off ever since. All my medical issues went into remission. I felt like a new man. I was 38, but I felt like I was in my 20s and healthy. I began the date again, embracing life, meeting new people. I climbed the CN Tower three times. I spent my 40th birthday with my partner in Miami Beach. My vacations now center around activity, such as walking, swimming, hiking, and cycling. In fact, I cycled a chunk of the California Pacific Coast Highway from Santa Monica to Laguna Beach. At the same time that I was losing my weight, I was also helping others to do the same. And I began to realize I was good at communicating with people the things that I've learned on my weight loss journey. And you want to know something? It felt great to do so. After almost 20 years of working in IT, it became apparent to me that helping others lose weight was where my true passion lied. In my time helping others towards sustained weight loss, the argument that I get all the time is that I can lose the weight, but the ultimate challenge is keeping it off. I get that. So what I've done is assemble a plan to go meet others. Others who have kept off the weight long term, anywhere from five to as much as 30 years. They will share their personal stories of hope with us. So I'll tell you what, let's go meet them, shall we? Tamika is 30 years old and works in human resources and travels back and forth from Canada and Hong Kong. She lost 90 pounds and has maintained that weight ever since. Taylor is a 25-year-old student studying philosophy. Taylor lost 150 pounds eight years ago. He is originally from North Pole, Alaska and now lives just outside of Atlanta. Erica is a 47-year-old operations manager from Madison, Mississippi. Erica lost more than 100 pounds five years ago Brian is 48 and a psychotherapist in Toronto. He lost 100 pounds twice and has been maintaining his current healthy weight for five years. Marty grew up in Winnipeg and lost 50 pounds 13 years ago. Marty works in logistics, now lives in Toronto. Susan is a 42-year-old psychology professor from Rochester, New York, and has maintained a 60-pound weight loss for more than 14 years. Alan is a 64-year-old former food industry rep, where he maintains a 70-pound weight loss going on for three decades. Aminta is in her 30s and works as a physician in Toronto. She lost 60 pounds in 2009 and has maintained that weight ever since. Michael is a 59-year-old former editor of a major Boston newspaper. He lost over 100 pounds on four different occasions. Kate is 39 and lives in Owensburg, Kentucky. She is a weight loss blogger and has maintained a 100-pound weight loss for 10 years. Jerome is 30 years old and lost 95 pounds six years ago. Jerome is originally from St. John's, Newfoundland. Sandra is 45 years old. She was formerly a production manager and now works as a life coach. She lost over 100 pounds 12 years ago and has maintained at that level ever since. Mike is a 49-year-old former minister and business executive who now works as a personal trainer. Lost 95 pounds and has kept it off for 15 years. 
Vera is 60 and a medical doctor who specializes in addictions. She lost 100 pounds 15 years ago and has maintained that weight ever since. Martha is a 62-year-old therapist originally from Pittsburgh. She lost 100 pounds 30 years ago. Hi, Martha. Yeah, Tony Vassallo here. Yeah, just to, just to follow up on, on the email, I thought it'd be easier uh, just to chat on, on the phone. Okay, thanks. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, no problem. All right, bye-bye. Take care. I was overweight from the time I was three or four years old. By the time I was in fourth grade, I weighed uh, 104 pounds. I had extremely um, high blood pressure. I had horrible uh, varicose veins. I had was getting uh, six to eight allergy shots a week. I had chronic upper respiratory infections with running fevers of like, um, um, 100 degrees Fahrenheit um, chronically and going to work all the time. My doctor basically said, I mean, I was in my late 20s and he said, you're too young to have all of these problems. Yet he didn't make any suggestions as to what I might do to fix the problems. And at no time did he suggest that maybe it would help for me to lose weight. I got discouraged and just stopped going to the doctor. When I did reach out for help, um, when I was in my, I believe I was in my very early 30s, I, I, was, I was in a place of deep desperation. I was really, I, I was, I was really ready to end my life. I did used to stand by my bed before I would lay down and wonder if I if I go to bed tonight, am I going to wake up? Am I going to die in my sleep because I'm so fat? In the same week, I was I got a notice from my boss that I was losing my job, that I was on like a final want, written warning. And uh, a few days later, my wife said she wanted me to leave because of how I was being at home. So uh, that was enough. There's a number of, of moments. Uh, one in particular uh, I always like to share that uh, can resonate with younger uh, people is in, in junior high, uh, my classmates brought me a, a bra to uh, physical uh, education because of the man boob problem. And that's, I think, about as candid as, as I, can, I can be. So I hate this, I hate this. Uh, you know, in May of 2003, my, uh, a, fr a mentor of mine uh, who helped me with my, my alcoholism in the early days um, had also attended this program for weight loss for men. And I called him when I just woke up one day and I remember just grabbing my midsection and feeling and, I, and it just clicked in with me that this is this is not you. You are huge. You know, I had a 48 inch waist almost. It was between a 46 and a 48. I'm 30 to 32 right now. I, I, I mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physiologically, I I felt horrible. I, I you know. Even today, my physical health is so much better than it was back then. It was like I was too, too young to feel that unwell. But one of the impetuses to, to lose the weight um, 
a little embarrassing. I'm lying on the couch watching some TV. There happens to be one fly in the room landed on my belly. So I went to swat it off and the belly rippled like waves. I said, that's not gonna do. All my life I've been fat. I've struggled with this thing. I'm sick of it. I don't wanna do it anymore. I was mad, you know? I'd gone from, I'd gone from angry, you know, at the thought of having to give up Kentucky Fried Chicken and whatever I wanted to, to angry at the fact that I was, I'd let it go as far as I did. Like I, the job ended a couple of months in and, and the relationship kept getting worse and, you know, moving out and leaving. I had three kids, so there were a lot of emotions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's a miracle that I didn't, you know, just binge my brains out. Then in 2008, my mom got bedridden with the medical condition. Suddenly it hit me. It was like, you know, that was an eye opener. I I told myself, hey, I've been doing all these fad diets and, uh, you know, exercising on and off, but not really sticking with it, not realizing I have bad genetics on both sides. And the doctor in me kicked in and then I finally decided, okay, now it's time to really put my foot down and do it the right way. So happened that I was running for a class. I had this professor that if you were late for class, and this was during school, he would close the door and he wouldn't let you in. And he he would give really important information in those classes where you had to be there. And I remember the class before that class was on the other side of campus. So it required you to run. And there was one time where I, it was before a midterm and I had to make that class. And because I was overweight and I couldn't run and I needed to take multiple breaks, I was locked out of his class. And truth be told, that was probably the moment where I had that breaking point where I said, it's time for a change. And this is where it happened for me. If you think back to my introduction, I was talking about being in a big and tall clothing store. Well, this is, this is where it happened. This very parking lot. I haven't been here since. I think it happened about eight years ago. I got in my car feeling totally hopeless. So I left the parking lot and eventually got home. I did start to feel that sense of hope that things were going to change. Because if you think about it, when you hit bottom, there's only one direction and that's up. so many things to lose weight. I struggled for years and it felt like that movie Groundhog Day where uh, it was just back and back and back to the same feeling of confidence and determination and excitement when I would start a new plan and then um, it would work for a little while and I would lose some weight and then uh, as I look back in my memory, I can never really be sure exactly what happened. Why, why didn't, I'm sure it would have worked if I'd have kept doing it mm-hmm. for another year, you know, I would have been thin, but I didn't. And for some reason, there was an issue with longevity, an issue with sort of the stickiness of the approach that I could never keep sustaining it. There would be some kind of like fuzzy time warp thing and all of a sudden I would be back to being as heavy as ever. I mean, the, the, the diet would lead to a period of success, which would lead to a period of wishy-washiness where I was kind of making exceptions with it, but still thinking I was probably okay because I wasn't packing on the pounds yet, which would lead to a period of more exceptions and a period of, oh, well, like, let's not really pretend. I'm not really doing this anymore. And so um, I might as well, then a, then a little period where I was sort of relieved that I was taking my comfort and food again and re-enjoying all the things about unrestrained eating that I missed during that period of restraint. And um, the stress of whatever was going on in my life was being 
um, medicated and masked by the food that I was eating, and then I would be back to heavy again, and then there would be a period of um, getting desperate enough to rally for another attempt, and I did that cycle over and over and over and over again. I don't have an off switch with, or I might have an off switch the first couple of times, but really and truly there's there's a very definable point where if I eat those things, I'm going to basically behave like a drunk person and just keep eating and want more and more and more. It took years of trying everything under the sun. I knew, certainly when I got overstuffed, I knew I was stuffed, but I still wanted to eat more. You know, I, I've told this story many times. The place where my disease, my addiction takes me or used to take me, is to the floor of my living room at 3 in the morning. I got off of work at, at 12, I went to the market, I got enough food so that I wouldn't have to go out again until morning. And I started, eat, I started to eat it. And I kept eating it. And I ate it until I was no longer able or willing to sit up because it was so uncomfortable, so I, now I'm laying on the floor. And even though it's three in the morning and I, uh, many people would want to go to sleep at three in the morning, I didn't think, one, I was involved in self-abuse at the time. The food was self-abuse. Well, I didn't deserve to go to bed. But also, more to the point, if I just laid there for a little while longer, I might get a little more room to stuff a little bit more in. And that's what I wanted to do. Yes, food owned me, absolutely. The... the um absolutely owned me. Um, you know, I can, when, when I have a crack patient telling me that the incessant desire to, even when they're lighting up their pipe, mm -hmm. they are, they're figuring out how can I get more because they've just spent their last five bucks. That would have been me, even as I'm gulping down whatever it is I'm eating, I'm already thinking, how am I going to fit in the next thing? Like, it, it, there, there was, it, it, uh, there was no way I could just say, mm -hmm. okay, I'm full, I'm done, that's it. It was all about, um, when is this thing going to end tonight so that I can get some sleep? That's how bad it got. Um, uh, nothing was more important to me than sugar. Uh, my family wasn't more important to me than sugar. My relationships, my homework, my job was to be in school and that was not as important to me as eating sugar. And in fact, I was a terrible student probably because I was high on sugar all the time. Didn't want to eat sugar in front of people and sometimes I couldn't stop myself. Like I'd be at school and like knowing that I was this fat girl and knowing that I shouldn't be eating candy in front of people and not being able to not eat candy. Um, you know, and that's to me, like, it's not that I was waiting till I got home cause that I maybe wouldn't have understood that sugar owned me if I could wait till I got home. Like I'm sitting here humiliated and I still cannot stop eating the sugar. I was a slave. For that, I keep craving it and craving it and craving it. And also, like, notice on um, when I do, uh, when I do sort of at times when I've I've had setbacks and I binge eat on 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 the sugar. That's when I I notice in the mirror like right away the, a difference, and I'm bloated again, and I guess inflammation and and that sort of thing. I am addicted to certain substances. And so those substances always contain sugar, and I'm talking about, I'm not talking about fruit, I'm talking about sugar, and they contain flour for me. Those two things, once I start, I cannot stop. And the diet industry had always told me moderation, learn how to have a cookie, count your points, you can have it and be fine. And I guess what, what I don't understand is we don't do that with drug addicts. I've never heard of a therapist sitting someone down and saying, listen, I want you to have cocaine in moderation. Just announce on your birthday and then put it away and then have announce at Christmas. Like, so why was that advice always given to me? It didn't work. Moderation just kept me in a cycle of relapse. I, yes, I, well, at that point I would have just called it sugar addiction. 
um, I had a, uh, it was, like I said, this penny dropping saying I should treat my food like a drug in the same way that my patients are using, uh, are treating their substance. Um, looking back on my food journey, I just loved food as a kid. I just, I just loved it. Food lit me up right from the beginning. I think it's something that's familiar and yeah, it's just, just a comfort thing, especially when you're home alone in nighttime and you know, uh, you just start to do it for, for sort of the sake of it and routine, you know, uh, I'm the type of person too. Um, if I eat, uh, if I eat two pounds of chicken wings today, uh, next time I've got to eat two pounds plus two, you know what I mean? Like I, I sort of, I always, uh, you know, at least say I'm extreme personality and I sort of, whatever I do, I, I, I stick to it and do even more every time. And, um, so yeah, I, I, I definitely used, uh, use food as a, as, as a lot of comfort and, and just a familiarity thing. I would, uh, it, when I was stressed, I would eat even worse than I was, uh, before. Um, the story that I tell and, and I told, I mentioned this to you is that in starting my, uh, in starting my diet the second time, I ate Nutella with white bread for breakfast for a month. And so what happened for me was the big change was when I realized that I actually had to take myself through a grieving process because what, what I was facing was having to give up my best friend, which were foods like pizza, hamburgers, French fries, late night chocolate bar runs and donuts and all that sort of thing. I was, I was staring at not being able to even eat them once in a while as cheat meals because I tried that for years and it wasn't working. It was keeping me crazy and keeping me overweight. So it was about grief, you know? So I started reading up on grief, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and all the other gurus out there and realized that I was literally going to have to go through a process where I was going to let this thing go. The hardest part of which was the anger phase. Sitting in the anger phase going, why? Why can't I eat those things like other people? Just just say no, just say no. When, I, when that cookie or platter comes around, just say no. Because if I say yes, I'm not taking one cookie, I'm taking the whole plate and I'm locking myself in a closet. And I know that. For me, it became just focus on today. Today I'm not gonna eat that stuff. I'm, let's, not, let's not worry about 25 years from now. You know, my spouse was like, well, what about our anniversary? What are you going to do? You're not even going to have it then? Can't you do it then? And it's like, you know, that's not for seven more months. Let's just worry about today. Let's just focus on right now. And today, I'm not going to do that. And so I think that really helps with perspective. It can be very intimidating to say, I can't say I'm not going to eat a blah, blah, blah for the rest of my life. But I can say that today. Yeah. I can do that today. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Yeah. Today's roll into a lot of today's. Today's turn into years. And then you realize, amazingly, there is life beyond that other food. Once I put away, once I followed the suggestion that I got right at the beginning, sugar and flour, refined sugar, refined grain, I got an entirely different footing. They say that the definition of insanity is repeating the same behavior over and over again and expecting a different result. That's why we're here typical greasy spoon where you'd find my kryptonites, the foods that owned me. You know, uh, the burgers, the pizza, the wings, the nachos, the fried chicken. I later learned that desserts also had a certain hold on me too. So the question you might have is, do we miss this stuff?
Over the course of the journey, I realized there are two ways of looking at food. Either I, I live to eat, as I used to, or I can eat to live, as I do now. What's the most surprising, even a bit mind-boggling, uh, to me included, is how I made this shift, uh, literally a paradigm shift up here. Because the old Tony didn't even want to be in the same room as healthy food. Now, I embrace it, I enjoy it, I can't go a day uh, without it. I'm talking the fruits, the vegetables, uh, the, the whole grains, the lean proteins, uh, even the sardines. I say that you, you have to have you have to have faith. Uh, it is truly an unexplained phenomenon uh, of how I went from I want that greasy bacon mm -hmm. hamburger to I would love nothing more mm -hmm. than a bowl of steamed broccoli. Mm -hmm. It's truly unexplainable, and to to the skeptic. I would just say, just step out on a little bit of faith here. Try it. And after a few months, you too will see that, you know what? The apple really is sounding good. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was amazing the longer and longer I've been at this, the more and more that has been proven true uh, to me that it's a hot summer day. I don't, I don't want a milkshake. Mm -hmm. I want a, a nice cold Georgia peach. Mm -hmm. And that is something that only time and faith can, can, can prove. Okay, so it sounds like you're not white knuckling in this. No. Nobody can white knuckle 10 years. No, I don't recommend. I don't recommend that. I love food. <laughs> I love food. I love to eat. I, I always will. I mean, to me, I know there are people in certain programs who are like, you cannot have any emotion around food. It has to be like dirt. No. I get to eat wonderful food and love every bite and I literally it's three of the best parts of my day is when I get to eat. I just now because I don't eat certain foods now there's sanity around my food. Um, things that I Lo I mean, that I love, you know, I mean, don't get, don't come between me and my Brussels sprouts. Seriously, like, do not come between me yeah. and my Brussels sprouts. Like, you will lose an arm. Like, that is it. Yeah. Um, which is ridiculous, you know what I mean? Like, who, who walks around going, I love Brussels sprouts? Not a lot of people. The week I started my weight loss program was the week that Krispy Kreme donuts arrived in town. And I was ticked because I started the weight loss before they arrived. I was at a friend's uh, place for July 1st, and he had a box of Krispy Kremes. I said, you know what? I have to taste it just to say I did. And he brought them out, and I cut a quarter of a donut, and that's what I ate. I got my taste of Krispy Kreme, and I thought to myself, I'm not missing much. So when I'm in Hong Kong, like I mentioned, thankfully I'm not into Chinese food as much. It's delicious, don't get me wrong, but it's not a, it's not a, it's not a vice. Um, so I can be very healthy in my home and in Hong Kong, I can say no to going out. I'm very comfortable with that. I'm the girl who brings Tupperware everywhere. I'm okay with that. But when I get to somewhere where the food is gonna be good, I allow myself a treat. What I was struggling with when I first moved here was the amount of travel and, the, and allowing myself to cheat in Hong Kong and cheat on vacation. So it wasn't, there was no balance. Whereas now if I'm home for 70% of the month, 80% of the month, I am, healthy 80% of the month and 20% of the month I allow myself to live and enjoy. Absolutely. F uh, food is fuel. Um, certainly I think it's, for me, it's really important that to the best of my ability that I enjoy um, the food that I'm eating in the moment that I'm eating it and 
that it provides me the nourishment and the energy to go about my day. Yeah, I think, yeah, every so often I figure out how many roughly calories it is. It's, yeah. you know, maybe 25, 2600 calories. And um, I don't feel hungry. You know, my, you know, maintains, you know, my energy's there, everything. It's a couple of things. For me, it's a lifelong dream to have something called food serenity. To just be completely serene around food and have it return to what its rightful purpose is. And so not to use it to numb out, not to use it for celebration, not to use it for love, but to have it be what it's supposed to be. Um, and so for me to be at peace with food, that means that I'm at peace with myself, I'm at peace with you, and I'm at peace with food. Like it's, it's all connected for me um, nicely. So food, food serenity, first of all, I want to say is just living life without the uh, domineering, dominating intrusiveness that food had become for me. And instead, my relationship to food is one where I enjoy it. It's not, I know that some people talk mm -hmm. about food as a fuel and that's how I want to see it. No, I, I have three meals a day and I love those meals. I look forward to them, uh, especially when I'm hungry and getting closer to those meals. I love them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I don't worry about how much I'm going to eat because I know how much I'm going to eat. There's no anxiety around it. And the desire for the food feels appropriate um, to um, hunger. And we want food. I mean, it is a natural pleasure, and I enjoy the natural pleasure of it. Um, but it's not an excessive, it's not intrusive, it's... Um, uh, it, it feels like it's appropriate and pleasurable. And that's what I call food serenity. So we're at one of my uh, typical hangouts where I like to eat now. Um, what's interesting, so this is a plant-based or it's a vegan restaurant and it's a total 180 from where I'd used to go. Um, so where I used to go would be actually a carnivore-based uh, place to eat like the, the last uh, place I showed you. Uh, it's not that I don't eat uh, animal-based proteins, it's just it's not my main uh, macronutrient, if you will. This is uh, my typical order. It's called a, uh, well, it's an all-star salad. It's a, it's a big salad because I need my fix of veggies. What's interesting though is this is, this contains, okay, with the exception of the tomatoes and the cucumbers, everything else, everything in this salad, I never would have touched. Uh, at the bottom is quinoa, never would have touched it. I still can't spell it, but I love eating it. The veggies in here, it's got kale, it's got shaved Brussels sprouts, it's got sweet potatoes. We used to eat sweet potatoes. The way I used to eat sweet potatoes is I'd mash them up with marshmallows. That's a big famous uh, southern dish. Don't eat that, that stuff anymore. Uh, it's got some goji berries, uh, a very light vinaigrette of olive oil and lemon juice. Uh, it's got some beans and I get a side order of uh, black beans because I do need some protein. And it's got some tofu. It's not one of my favorite things, but I do like to mix it up every once in a while. Okay, so. Uh, it is uh, time to eat. Bon appetit. To make sure I didn't drift from the path, I had to make sure certain things were in place. Some obvious stuff, like not having junk food in my home and not visiting my food haunts, uh, meal planning, logging my food. A lot of the stuff I'm sure you've heard over and over again. And then there were things that were not so obvious that helped keep me on the path. Uh, first of which, getting rid of television. Becoming part of a support group to keep me accountable. But I have to tell you, most surprising was the importance of being outdoors. 
It was discovery time, where I discovered a new me. Um, I found myself. I'm finding myself. I went on a 5,000 mile road trip, interviewing strangers on their front porches, getting out in the world. You know, this girl who had been so hidden in her fat and in her protection is now driving around the countryside. Hi, I'm Erica. I love your porch. Can we talk about it? You know, it's, that's crazy. So I guess, I started writing more. I'd always been a writer, but I started writing mm -hmm. in earnest. You know, at first I think it was a form of therapy, but now, um, now it's, I would say it's a positive pacifier, absolutely. You know, <laughs> my positive pacifier when I started, it's so funny, is that, and I still do, I'm still a little obsessed. Um, my husband makes fun of me. I read Japanese comic books on romance for teenage girls. I read shoujo manga, and I am obsessed with shoujo manga. So that was my first positive pacifier, was that I would go to the Barnes & Noble uh, that's actually closed now, that was open until midnight, and I was a night eater, and I would worry about night eating. So I'd go to the Barnes & Noble, and I would read Japanese comics until they closed. And then I would take as long as I could to get all the way back to my apartment uptown so that I could sleep, so that I could, so that I could get through the night without eating. So yeah, through my, through my years of putting, um, you know, boundaries around my food, I've, I've taken up a bunch of different positive pacifiers, but yes, I always have to have something that is not food. I think I replaced one addiction with another. Like I, I sort of have a, an addictive personality. I'm a bit of an extreme personality. If I'm going to be a fat guy, I'm going to be the best fat guy. If I'm going to be a fit guy, I'm going to be the best fit guy. Like I said, I, I, would, I never wanted to, and I, I always have been a little bit afraid of, of sort of sabotaging myself and and uh, going back to being fat Jerome. Being fit Jerome is a lot a lot better than being, being fat Jerome. And um, like I said, I, I was very lucky to to happen to find uh, martial arts and find kickboxing and, and jiu-jitsu. I believe this time I was motivated from within because of what, uh, well, it started off my mom being sick, so it was more like a scare from within that I don't want to uh, be bedridden or end up with medical problems. The, when I was doing the fat diet, it was more because other people were saying, you're looking overweight, you don't look good, you don't fit into this dress. So I was trying to do it, okay, I want to fit into this dress or I want to look as good as she does for the prom or whatever it is. So I was doing it to make other people happy. The first attempt wasn't really grounded in, in, any, sort of, in any sort of way. Um, I did it because I wanted to impress other people. I did it because I was a naturally thin uh, child. My family has fairly good genes in, in, in that regard. If it had to be focused on, on one particular aspect, it would be the United States Marines. Mm -hmm. uh, wanting that, growing up without a mm -hmm. father figure in my life, I needed that. Yeah. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was 16, I'm driving a smart car. Where, where, where's that manliness yeah. in me? Yeah. So it all focus, came out on, on the, the, the Marines and, and the, um, the United States Armed Forces having that motivation. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that was really a, a backbone yeah. of, of my strength. Yeah. Uh, from, without the support of other people, I never would have made it, mm -hmm. for sure. So that could have been more important. And, uh, and also along there having a spiritual awakening mm -hmm. and really getting connected with the God, really, uh, that also made, that was the biggest difference. Mm -hmm. Group support. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, one of the bedrocks of my transformation. I went from this guy who said, I got it covered. I don't need your information. I don't need your opinion. Thank you very much. And it wasn't just, no, I'll pass. There was an edge, a real hard edge to it. If I think about the three um, things 
the pillars of my recovery. One is eliminating the drug. Um, two is getting that spiritual connection. And three is being part of a support system. That is, I cannot do this alone. And I don't think many can. And I think that's why the success rate is pretty low is because we don't want to be a part of a supportive community. And so not only was I part of a supportive community, but I found a mentor. And this mentor had exactly what I wanted. And what I learned at that stage was to no longer trust my thinking. Because my best thinking got me to over 260 pounds, not leaving my house or even working. So it was like, okay, I need to trust someone who got their life together. And if I do what they do, I'm going to get what they get. More than a weight loss, it's about changing into a healthy individual. Like I was just saying, it's about loving yourself. Because once you love yourself, you again, coming back to the noise from the world, it's there, it's a necessary evil. You need to be in the world, but you learn to sh uh, shut it out to the point that you can take care of yourself so you become a healthy individual. The weight, yes, is what's causing your problems, but in the end, you want to be healthy mind, soul, and body. Um, reason why it worked was because um, I didn't do it alone. I let people help me. I, I reached out to a community of support. I have found that um, um, when I lost the weight and as I have maintained the weight loss, I have discovered my soul. As I was losing my weight, I developed a sense of connection uh, to myself, where I had a little voice that just kept reminding me I was deserving and capable of a better me. A and that kept me grounded. This documentary was spurred by the naysayers and the pundits that tell us weight loss, it's impossible. Thankfully, I never bought into that message, nor do I want you. Well, as cynical as it may be, I mean, you say impossible, what is impossible? Uh, I believe in impossibilities are, are things that we as, as beings put, put on ourselves. If you say something's impossible, then it will be in, impossible. Statistically, I'm called a one percenter. Uh, that means I'm in the group that has kept the weight off. I'm not a statistic. I'm an individual. Where I live, how I live, who I associate with, what I eat, when, how much I exercise, that's all determined by me. Anybody could be in that one percent group if they choose to. I'm going to chalk it up to willingness. Um, just a willingness to do this thing, like a real desire, an honest desire and willingness to do it. And there's been times when I wasn't willing. So thinking positively, critical to, to life, and it, it, it is the psychological equivalent of breathing. If I could tell this Erica now, Erica six years ago, I would say it's gonna be okay. I would say it is worth it. I would say- My son. My son and my wife, my family, I know it's important to me and they are important to me. And I have a lot of gratitude about them. And there are lots of things that I could mention that were leading to that, but that is what it is. I got used to myself as a fat person. It didn't feel like it fit for the yeah. longest time, but ultimately I acclimated to that. Yeah. And, and I developed the identity of a fat person and then transitioning to the identity of a thin person and really being, willing and able to step into that reality and own it and claim it for the long term, I think for a lot of people, um, it's uncomfortable and they shift back. Oh my God, I would just say it's okay. It's just so okay. Stop. Stop beating yourself up. Stop fighting food. Just, it's not worth it. It's time lost. Um, you know, I say now, 
Me against those deep fried foods, I lose every time. Me against those baked goods, I don't get in the ring. Stop getting in the ring, don't fight anymore. This life that a person can lead um, uh, is so much better. You have so much more energy and purpose and drive. I have so much more energy, purpose and drive. Um, uh, you know, food serenity works, but it's, it's, it's more than serenity. It's um, joyfulness about life that got lost in the food is free. Um, when I put sugar down, like when I stopped eating it, and when I stopped eating it with the desire to never eat it again, um, I was overwhelmed with peace. So you have to connect to that reason as to why you're doing this. And I always share with them my why. And I still have my why to this day from back when I used to journal on my journey. Oh, well, um, in my line of work um, and, and through my support systems, we have a, um, a saying that I love, and that is don't give up before the miracle happens. So without fear. So I have transformed into a person without fear uh, of the world uh, so that I can go after anything that I want to in life because this is my life, I'm my own boss, and that's why I'm here the way I am today. Because, you know, the plan I'm on, I've been doing for well over 28 years, and it's worked for me. And it's worked for a lot of other people for longer than that that I know. I want to just say freedom tastes great. At the beginning of this film, I invited you on a journey and asked you to come follow me, follow others. Well, in a sense, that journey is starting to come to an end. But for many of you, hopefully a new and positive journey has just begun. Through the making of this documentary, I had the opportunity to meet so many diverse people whom shared a similar path. For me, it was a real privilege to have been able to listen and to be able to share that with all of you. I'd like to thank them for their time and their incredible hospitality. In many circumstances, before getting to know them, they were complete strangers. And yet, because of their kindness and openness, they allowed me into their homes. The title for this documentary was inspired by a paragraph from Taylor LeBaron's book. Follow me. It's a long, winding, narrow tunnel, but I guarantee there is light at the other ends because I have been all the way to freedom. You've been a prisoner of your own body too long, and it's time to break free. You can find a million ways to escape, but here is a nice tunnel that is already dug. Just follow me through to freedom. It's better than you ever imagined. I'll walk you through the gardens in my home. Put me anywhere, I'll find the way back on my own. St. Julius, the St. Paul's Grotto. You say why not when I say tomato And I carried that for so long And I believe the will had gone And I carried that for so long And I believe What?